Hello everybody. I am David Shipley Alexander. Welcome to my Infinite Energy series on YouTube. In my first introductory video, I define infinite energy as usable energy produced by a non-conventional source. In my second video, I gave background information for LENR. It's an acronym for Low Energy Nuclear Reactions. In my third video, I explained how the extension of LENR to high temperatures, which has occurred, provides the possibility of a new form of energy for homes, automobiles, and commercial aircraft. In my fourth video, I began an explanation of how LENR can very possibly make a faster trip to Mars feasible compared to coasting many months in a transfer orbit. However, I plan to find more information and update that topic more decisively in the future. So beginning this, my fifth video, I introduce my five friends. So these are wooden models of what are referred to as the Platonic solids described by the Greek philosopher Plato who lived from 428 to 347 BC. We have the tetrahedron with four faces, four vertices, the cube or hexahedron with six faces and eight vertices, the octahedron, eight faces, six vertices, which is the inverse of this one, the dodecahedron, 12 faces, 20 vertices, and the icosahedron, 20 faces, 12 vertices, which is the inverse of this one. Where I bought these is referenced below. The first three appear in the form of some minerals, the last two do not. Interestingly, the dodecahedron and the icosahedron have the golden ratio in their geometry, and that golden ratio is found in all living things. The golden ratio spiral is easily seen if you look at the face of a sunflower, the arrangement of the seeds. My interest in these shapes began about a year ago, when a rather arcane colleague told me I should place my attention upon the dodecahedron. So I did. Then I thought, where do I find the dodecahedron in nature? Then I recalled an October 2003 article in physicsworld.com in which cosmologists in the France and the United States stated that satellite measurements of what they call the cosmic microwave background radiation were consistent with the shape of the universe being a dodecahedron. Wow! So then I, I did a search on where are dodecahedrons found in science or technology. One item that came up shook me totally. I knew it was potentially very important. In the mid-1980s, Dr. Robert J. Moon, and this is his picture from one of the articles I will be talking about, who had provided significant contributions to bringing in the development of, of what I call classical nuclear physics in the 1940s, began the development of an entirely different model of the atomic nucleus the Moon model. Dr. Moon built this model with steps of logical reasoning, not arbitrary assumptions. The core idea, pun intended, of his model is that the protons and neutrons in the nucleus do not revolve in orbits, but instead the protons are located on the vertices of concentric nested platonic solids. Double wow. As the old-time alchemist said, as above, so below. The whole universe is the 
dodecahedron above and the dodecahedron and the others, the below is below the range of vision where they're in the nuclei of atoms. The importance of the moon model to me is that nuclear physics, as it is academically taught, cannot explain how low energy nuclear reactions, LENR, can occur. Another model is needed. In 1987, Dr. Moon described his path to the model of the atomic nucleus, which began in 1985. He was aware of an experiment by a researcher named von Klitzing, who had maintained a constant electric current through a semiconductor at liquid hydrogen temperature and observed voltage peaks occurring as a function of magnetic field strength through the semiconductor. From that beginning, Moon had a series of intuitive leaps. He was a genius. Then at 4 a.m. one morning, the flash insight came to him that space is quantized. He also mentioned in passing that time is quantized. Then a second flash insight came that if space is quantized, it should be quantized with the highest degree of symmetry. Therefore, that would be the platonic solids. The development of Dr. Moon's model and its extension by his colleague Lawrence Hecht and others is presented in a series of articles from 1988 to 2009 available online referenced below. There is much information in these articles. I only present a few highlights. I present here a brief summary of the Moon model written in 2007 by Dr. Moon's colleague, Lawrence Hecht. So I'm, I'm actually going to read that. I changed a few words, but not very many. In 1986, Manhattan Project veteran and University of Chicago professor of physical chemistry and physics, Dr. Robert J. Moon, discovered that nuclear properties, especially stability, as attested by abundance, could be correlated to a geometric model of the nucleus in which the protons assume positions at the vertices of four of the five platonic solids, Q, octahedron, icosahedron, and dodecahedron taken in that order. The four solids are conceived as nested within one another. The first eight protons comprising oxygen, the most abundant element in the Earth's crust, fill the vertices of the cube. Six more protons fill the surrounding octahedron to produce the nucleus of silicon, element 14, the second most abundant element. Surrounding the octahedron is an icosahedron and filling its 12 vertices produces iron, element number 26, the most abundant element in its weight class on Earth and the most abundant in the meteorites. The icosahedron is inscribed in the dodecahedron. That's the biggest one around them all. When the 20 vertices of the dodecahedron are filled, we have the nucleus of the element palladium element 46. Now that's the end of the part that uh, Lawrence Heck wrote that I slightly modified. So palladium completes the first moon nuclear structure, as I call it. It's a singularity. And it is the element in which doctors Fleischmann and Pons discovered LENR. Hmm, very interesting. Furthermore, as Hecht explains, the, the filling of a second 46 proton structure joined to the first at a single vertex, common to both, creates the 92 proton element known as uranium, the last of the natural elements. Transuranic elements start filling a third moon nuclear structure. Very interesting. 
Dr. Moon's use of what's called Weber, that's the German pronunciation of that man's name, Weber electrodynamics, to calculate the forces between moving charges in his model of the nucleus may even be more important than the use of nested platonic solids. Now, physics teaches that the force between two charged particles, for example two protons, varies as the inverse square of the distance between them. That's it. However, Weber in the 1840s in Germany, following up on the work of the French researcher Ampere, done in the 1820s, determined that the relative velocity and relative acceleration between two moving charges are also parameters that determine the force between two charged particles. In his 1871 memoir, Weber wrote that within a minimal distance of 3 times 10 to the minus 16 centimeter, two protons will attract each other, not repel, and will maintain a stable state where they continue to oscillate towards each other, then through each other, and then reverse, and they keep repeating doing that forever. So Dr. Moon, who helped bring in the not benign old nuclear physics, has brought to us, before he died in 1989, not only his geometric model of the atomic nucleus, but an appreciation of a now little-known theory of electrodynamics, including Weber's concept of purely electrical attraction between protons at close range, which I believe may lead to a better theoretical understanding of, and then advances in, the implementation of LENR. It is my hope and prayer that someone out there who sees this video will be inspired to follow the path started by Dr. Moon and others and bring forth advances to LENR technology. In my view, the momentum of the coming infinite energy must meet, equal, and surpass the inertia and purposeful suppression. And on that day, like the discovery of calculus, radio, sewing machine bobbin, multiple discoveries of infinite energy will occur simultaneously around the world. This is neither optimism nor prophecy. It is, in fact, an inevitability. Thank you for leaving a comment or question under these videos, subscribing, and leaving a thumbs up. My next video can be on a number of different topics, but I may be leaning towards propellant-less space propulsion. There is no need to expel mass out the back end of a spaceship to go forward. Have a look and see. Thank you very much for your attention. Until the next time, I am David Shipley Alexander.